My name is Justin Hicklin, and uh, I've been asked today to panel a discussion about brand ambassadorship. And um, I think this is one of the very current issues within the business. Where does it sit in marketing? Does it sit in sales? How important are brand ambassadors? How do I get one? You know, uh, and so on and so forth. So we've assembled a panel today of, I suppose, the great and the good of brand ambassadorship in uh, this country, all of whom have significant experience in um, building uh, advocacy programs for gins, um, but also are, are, are involved in some of the big gin brands at the moment. Um, so we're going to run this. I'm going to ask some questions. Um, uh, at the end, we're going to allow probably 15 minutes to be able to uh, allow you to ask individuals questions on the panel. Um, it, hopefully, it'll get a bit lively. Uh, a few of the topics that I've chosen to discuss are meant to be provocative. I'm not Jeremy Paxman, um, not even close. Um, um, but uh, I, I will ask people to be brief and pithy um, with a TH. Um, so uh, let's get on with it. I, I'm going to ask everybody to introduce themselves. Uh, in, in two minutes of, about you know where they've come from, what they've done, and what they're doing now. Great. Uh, my name is Duncan McRae, uh, Global Ambassador for Hendrix Gin. Uh, prior to that, um, four years ago, I was at uh, Reserve Brands looking after Tanqueray and Tanqueray 10. Before that, I was bartending in Edinburgh. Um, and, uh, that's it. My name's Jamie Walker. I've been in the industry for about 20 years. I started not as a bartender, because I wasn't good enough. I was a bar back. And then basically worked my way up from there to work into bartending, mixology. Then became one of the first... Uh, Global brand ambassadors for Bombay Sapphire about 10, 15 years ago. Um, and then from there, moved a little bit more back of house working with Diageo um, for a period of years. I now work with Euro Winegate for G Vine um, and look after trade advocacy for them. Uh, my name's Sam Searle. I've got a background um, as uh, an operator, um, having um, owned the Alphabet and Amber bars back in the uh, late 90s, co owned them with Spike Marchant. Um, and in fact, worked with Jamie there. Jamie was a, an excellent bartender on that side. <laughs> in, al um, in alphabet terms. Also have a, a background as a qualitative market researcher. Uh, so trade as a qualitative market researcher and managed to combine the world of spirits and qualitative research. So gone on to get involved in capability planning, commercialization strategies for, uh, for brands. Worked with a number of big spirits brands, not just gin brands, but a number of big brands. Um, including Bombay Sapphire and Grey Goose, among others. Um, and I'm currently a non-executive director of Sipsmith. Marvellous. Et voila. Hello, I'm Dan Thwaites. Um, not quite sure why I'm here, but it might, <laughs> might, might become evident with our ice creams in a minute. Um, so my background is uh, basically starting businesses and digital marketing, um, including for probably some of the brands in here. Um, to be honest, I felt a bit of a fraud uh, a while ago because I was sitting there advising them what to do with their money from the uh, sort of nice, comfortable situation of sitting there getting a salary. So about three years ago, my wife and I kind of dared each other to start a gin brand. You know, like when you dare each other and it's like, yeah, come on, let's do it. And you sort of end up doing it. Um, <laughs> Not usually about a gin brand, though, is it? Yeah. <laughs> um, so we... We developed a, a flavour that we really loved and then set about trying to work out how to make it happen. Uh, and through a combination of social media, um, meeting a whole load of really cool, interesting people, two or three of which I can see in the room here, who, who've helped us, um, we got our crowdfunding and produced our first batch that went out about a month and a half ago. And we're sort of slightly pleased and surprised where we've got to and working out what to do next. Um, like I said, I'm not sure I'm the great and the good, but I'll tell you what I've learned. Yeah. It's called Jam Jar Gin, by the way. If you, if you, <laughs> yes, you <laughs> mentioned it. It was in the brochure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, uh, I think everybody um, has different experiences of brand ambassadorship. And um, perhaps if I can start with uh, uh, <coughs> uh, Sam, um, from your perspective over a number of years, how has the role of a brand ambassador changed, do you think? Um, well, I think it's become increasingly important, um, there's no question. 
um, because I think right at the heart of effectively building brands, um, especially with the kind of customers and the kind of trade relationships we now have, it, it's all about relationships. And it's all about having credible relationships and building credible relationships. And without the kind of foundations that a brand ambassador can create in market and create advocacy in market, mm. uh, particularly perhaps at the top end of the industry, you don't build the, the, the foundations that you need um, to develop a brand um, further. Um, so uh, I think crucial, fundamental, and, and it's interesting how there's been an understanding that ambassadors are more, I think when, when we first, they were more about sales. Probably mm. 10 years ago, it was much more about sales. Now ambassadors are much more about um, developing relationships with the people that matter in the industry. And through developing those relationships, developing a role for their brand um, within those outlets. Duncan, in, in terms of Hendrix, uh, which has kind of gone from interesting brand uh, creating its own uh, uh, advocates to a far more mass market, has the, ro the role of a brand ambassadorship changed within grants and, and, and within that? within the Hendrix business? Um, in some ways, yes. In some ways, no. There's definitely a lot more of us. Uh, the, the Grants <laughs> family started with one ambassador uh, out of the Glenfiddich distillery about 15 years ago. And now we're a network of uh, over 80 of us around the world. So there's a lot more of us. But the role, um, and I think probably a little bit different to, to some of the other companies, the role of an ambassador was to be from the grants perspective, an extension of the family and not an extension of the sales force. You know, they've got distributors and partners around the world. And, and from day one, it was about advocacy and, and creating, um, you know, they, they saw the ambassador team as both the medium and the message um, and not just a, a sort of um, extension of the sales force in that sense. So it's one thing um, we fight really hard to protect with our team of ambassadors around the world that they through various distributors, etc., that they don't become, you know, cheap salespeople or, or brand dedicated salespeople, that they actually do um, fight really hard to remain their, their sort of independence in that sense and, and be purely focused on advocacy um, and, and telling the story rather than um, shipping boxes or, and, and doing everything in the right way. They're almost there as protectors mm. of the brand yeah. in a world which is driven by. They're slightly Get, get me away from the grubby commerciality of yeah. selling stuff. I, I would, I, I would, I, uh, the only caveat I would have to that is I think for, for no disrespect, but for bigger brands, I think it's, it's a much easier uh, approach to have. I mean, at the end of the day, we're all in sales. It's all about selling stuff at the end of the day. And I think if you're working for a smaller company, um, you do need to have an ambassador that has a commercial agenda mm. or commercial head on their shoulders to be able to I don't think if you've got a smaller team that you're going into, it's not. I don't think it's enough to go in there and, and to, to land really memorable messages, to land your brand story, to make people feel warm and, and engaged about your brand. At the end of the day, you do need to sign a deal at the end of it. And I think some, some of the smaller companies, I think, have to have an ambassador that, that does have that capability, that yeah. can do the, the nitty gritty, the dirty stuff, is, is to sign those deals. It's not dirty. That's the exciting bit. Mm. Um, Dan, you've just come into the industry as it were, do you find this idea of key influencers in the trade, who all the uh, spirits companies have ambassadors knocking on their door like they're the prettiest girl on the street, um, and, then, and then you come in, how, how, do you, how, how, how did you find that whole piece? Well, yeah, clearly not the prettiest girl on the street. Uh, what, it's quite interesting, I think the big challenge for the bigger brands is how do you actually have a meaningful conversation with people? Because I think a number of the bars that we've gone into, and we're only, we're only just starting. Uh, we have a really simple way, by the way, of deciding who we talk to. If we start talking to a bar and they really love gin and want to have a conversation, it's always fantastic. The ones who have been trained, and I think the industry perhaps is partly responsible for this, to basically go, right, give me the pack, give me the list, give me the, give me the discounts, we never get on very well with them. Um, and I think what we've learned, and what we've learned is from people we've spoken to, we've got about four, four and a half thousand people on our Facebook community who, who tell us this, is that people who actually care about what they drink, they want more of an experience, they want something other than just 
cheapest on display in Weatherspoons for three pounds fifty um, <coughs> with, a, with a free hot dog or, or whatever. Um, and I think the challenge for the big brands is how are you actually going to have a meaningful conversation? And I think there's two parts of that. <coughs> one, one bit is what are you actually doing for the bar that wants to create a meaningful experience, uh, by which I don't mean you know discounts and this that and the other. How are you helping them be special for their customers? And the thing that we found is helping them have a role in a bigger narrative and just going to them and saying, look, we started in this industry three years ago with <coughs> an excitement about creating a flavor that we really wanted to. Can you help us do that? They seem to have responded really well to that. I think that the challenge for the brand ambassador, which I really feel for you guys, is how do you, how do you have that meaningful interaction? So it's interesting to hear you know, part of the family because actually relaying that message and some of the concerns of the business and all that sort of thing. Um, but I think just going in and, and selling at people with the modern equivalent of the laminated sheets yeah. is probably not the way to go. I think that's an interesting point. <coughs> Sam, now, is there a sort of growing cynicism in, in the bar trade, do you think, about you know endless ambassadors coming in and selling the same sort of thing? Or do, do, does the family piece really play? I think it does. To some extent, you're right. There probably is cynicism around <coughs> some of the stories that ambassadors come in with or salespeople come in with. But um, people in the trade are, are incredibly kind of open-minded and open-hearted. And actually, when you approach them with a genuine story, with real humanity mm. at the heart of that story, and not only something they can engage with, but also something they can take to their consumers and their consumers can engage with, then it works fantastically well. So my experience of the trade, both working with bigger brands and indeed working with smaller brands, has been very much the open-heartedness, the interest, the engagement and the fascination that people in the industry have um, about the spirits category and yeah. about gin in particular. I'd like to develop <coughs> that theme and perhaps come back to Jamie and, and Duncan, is, is that a number of bars have almost created a business about working with emerging brands, and I don't know if people here have found. So all of a sudden, you go into a well-known bar, the manager comes out and says, we'd love to be a consultant for you, and, um, uh, and there's a listing fee and all the rest of it. So do you think that there is a, a growing tendency that I know is in New York, in the London bar trade, to view listing products as simply a way of, uh, of earning cash for having them on the back bar and not really doing anything for them? I think it's, it's something both at the top and bottom end of the industries. Um, you can call it like the hourglass effect, where if you're starting out, you know, the, there certainly is the, you know, sometimes as you were saying, the, the sort of, yeah, we can help you if, if you know, you pay for it sort of thing. And that's definitely at the very top of the industry. You'll see some of the biggest brands, you know, literally stalking the people that they want to, to work with and, and buying advocacy in that sense. Um, from our perspective, we are probably somewhere in the in the middle of that, where we we, you know, we don't just uh, we don't have the resources in terms of um, marketing expenditure to to go and, and compete on that stage. So we try and, as you were saying, create worthwhile experiences. And Hendrix has been built entirely through the bartender community to start with, and obviously now it's um, becoming slightly more uh, customer facing. Um, but the uh, what set us apart was that we would actually take time and create unique serves or interesting experiences and, and try and really connect and you know rather than sponsoring bars actually partner with them and, and work with them for dual benefit and I think that's the real key message is that if you're a tiny brand um, and someone comes in and says yep you can buy a place on our list the chances of that developing into genuine, heartfelt advocacy are probably pretty slim. Um, and, and what you were saying is that if people, you know, go right, what's the commercial conversation from the off? You know, you're probably best using your time and finding the people that are as excited to work with you as you are with them. Yeah. Um, and and that's certainly been a mantra with us, and and probably why we sort of sit somewhere in the middle of of, of that spectrum is because if someone doesn't genuinely feel excited to, to work with the brand, the chances of it being a long, meaningful, fruitful relationship, um, and that's certainly one of the mantras from the family, you know, they see it as a competitive advantage, being a family business that can think long term. 
um, you know, we probably lose out in the short term on that, but it, it hopefully would pay off in the long term. Jeremy, how, how, how do you find London versus other cities in terms of the sort of aggressive <coughs> requests for listing fees and, 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 and cash? I think London, even more so probably than the most cities around the world, probably excluding New York, is probably, uh, I dare say the word is, is not, but it's shown so much attention. Everybody sees London as a lighthouse sort of for the on-trade especially, that everybody seems to be vying for the attention of some of the top bars and restaurants, etc. Uh, I, I just want to echo uh, what's already been said. I think it's, it's very difficult. Just You can pay through the nose to be there, but unless the people who are actually behind your brand, know your stories, are willing to tell them, um, and they've, they've got that sort of element of advocacy that's embedded into them, then you're going to lose out. I know of stories in you know, some of the top bars in, in London, what will happen is people will go in and pay for a pouring right, so their gin on their, their speed, speed rail will be a certain gin that's been paid for, but the gin that sells more would be the one that the bartenders are behind. So, especially if you go into these sort of bars, you find the majority of the, you know, the, the serves will be, <coughs> as opposed to a generic gin, they'll ask you what sort of gin you want. So, the more, the, more you, the more they connect with your brand, the more likely they are to tell your story. And they're the gatekeepers for your brand. So, I think it's very important that you obviously are in those places, but you make sure that you have the right level of advocacy versus just paying for, for, for their endorsement. One of the questions that strikes me having done quite a bit of work in the States is that perhaps all of this ambassadorship is just taking ourselves far too seriously and that in fact Captain Morgan and the Morganettes having uh, half a dozen scantily clad girls arrive in a bar and offer people free drinks <laughs> may in fact be a better way of getting to the commercial end as opposed to pontificating over the botanicals in the glass. Um, Duncan, would you agree? <laughs> um, <laughs> it'd be a lot easier if I said yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I couldn't disagree more. I <laughs> enjoyed the deliberately provocative uh, question. Um, I think the the nature of the industry has changed. The nature of people's drink habits, why they're choosing certain things over another, has completely changed. And. Um, people are in a world of sort of homogenization. People are constantly looking for ways to define themselves and redefine themselves and carve out their own niches. And I think um, the amazing industry we work in is a great opportunity for people to do that. And gin, especially, you know, when you look at the amazing plethora of gins that are available, um, having, you know, and I, you can almost distill this right up into the martini cocktail. It's a definitive example of a statement that you can make about yourself. And and I use the martini as an analogy all the time because it's the most individual, but actually the simplest thing, but you can assemble it in, in a way that makes it completely individual to you and your taste and speaks volumes about your personality. And I think it's a great analogy to take to the, the whole spirits category as a world. Uh, as, as a world. Um, the more you can get bartenders and people talking about your brand as a... As a, as a choice, as a identity sort of um, choice and, and a, a symbol of your own values and, and sort of internal um, substance, then the more opportunities there are for people to connect to it. And um, our, our mantra from day one and big capital letters on the back of the bottle was, it is not for everyone. And that wasn't a sort of hmm. preemptive, responsible drinking message. It was, you know, sort of in quite an inc inclusive way, sort of challenging people to say, you know, you might not like this. It's 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 the slightly mar exclusive. The marmite moment. Yeah, and uh. and that's that's something that obviously you know we we still use, but it, it yeah. we can't say it with the same sort of vigor that we we used to. <laughs> yeah, because um, we'd like everybody to like it. Yeah, but um, um, can I just ask Dan? Um, too much intellect, not enough sex. I mean, not you particularly, but... <laughs> um, I think as an industry, we've probably taken our advertising and marketing a little bit too seriously and think that people are much more interested in it than they really are. So if you look at some of the big brands, they've basically taken big TV ads and thrown them, thrown them up against social media and wondered why everyone's not really, really excited about it. 
Um, I think if you look at some of the trade engagement stuff I've seen from some of the bigger brands, again, it looks like TV advertising. And I'm sure if you throw enough money at it, it works. But broadly, people don't go onto social media to see more ads. They go to find special things that mean something that I think they can take part in. Uh, and I think if what we've done, I'd like to say it was fantastically well planned. I, I think it was probably more a bit of luck is we wanted to create a gin that was all about encouraging people who perhaps weren't cocktail aficionados to have a go at trying new things and getting over some of that fear. Um, and the thought that if you start with a really decent product and, and test things, that, that's a good place to start. And it seems to have got people excited about it. We haven't done any TV advertising, um, <coughs> yes, not surprisingly. Really. We, we, did, we did, make, did make a crowdfunding film. Um, so, I mean, broadly, I think, I think we take, as an industry, we perhaps take our own marketing a bit too seriously. and We're not open and honest enough with what we're trying to do and understanding the role that we play in our drinkers' lives. Um, Sam, how many more £35 craft gins do you think the market can take? <laughs> I um, thought it was going to be a, a carry on from the question about the Morganettes, which I was... No, I know, I know your view on the uh, Morganettes, and um, it's not healthy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, it is. Uh, sorry, any, any more? Well, you know what, craft, I don't, you know, there's going to be a session about it this afternoon. I don't really know what it means. It's a very overused word. It's used at the heart of marketing of a number of brands. Uh, for me, it means a gin that has had real human beings engaging with it right the way through the process. Um, it's had, there's been attention to detail. There's been attention to the recipe. There's been, you know, there's there's been real human beings involved, um, involved um, with the process. So from that point of view, craft being about real people, real stories, real humanity, real warmth, yes. Um, but in terms of just being an overused word that is the means of a mass market corporate brand giving itself some kind of credibility, no. <laughs> Be scared um, out there, uh, Jamie. What, what this this balance between storytelling and events for ambassadors? How do you how do you see that working? It really does depend, I think, on your brand and therefore your audience. So I guess this links in with who your ambassador would be. So going back to the Morganettes, just for yeah. you. Yeah. Um, you know the reason that they're there. I wish we had work, a slideshow. They, you know, exactly. <laughs> they work perfectly well they for work, Captain Morgan. Exactly, they work That's perfectly fine. well for, for Captain Morgan. But when you're when you're dealing with Hendrix or something like that, you need a, a much higher sort of personality, much more textured personality to be to be able to be the conduit for that story. Mm. And I think you know with the with the really good brands, what they can do is they hire the right people, and they hire the right people not through you know, celebrity where they've been before, but through grit and also through, um, you know, you can teach pretty much the rest. They have high EQ, they know what they're doing, they know how to hold an audience, know how to tell a story. And if you do it well, then you can encapsulate an event and have them as, you know, as the main person. So you have the set, you have the, the speeches, and you have the actors who are the brand ambassadors that can deliver, uh, you, know, you know, a 360 experience. Um, so, but I think the most important thing are the scripts and the and the brand ambassadors to be able to deliver that message. Duncan, how do you go about choosing ambassadors? What do you look for in the Hendrix team? Because you've got I don't know how many you've got in the UK now. Um, none at the moment in the UK, having me just moved into the global team. So we're recruiting. We if anyone's uh, no, um, we're, we've got interviews today actually. But um, we, I mean, there is no uh, sort of cookie cutter brand ambassador profile. It's a really hard job for corporate companies or co companies with an existing human resources structure like William Grant and Sons to, to recruit because there is, no, um, there is no perfect ambassador. We get together once a year as a team of Hendrix ambassadors and what I take away from it is that it's an amazing bunch of really individual people and collectively actually, you, none of them are the perfect Hendrix ambassador. Individually, sorry, but collectively, <laughs> um, <laughs> collectively, somehow, you know, people pushing their own little areas, and, and we've all got completely different interests, profiles, um, you know, and uh, whilst when we're working, we may all sort of 
develop a sort of look, as it were. But the the thing is, it's a very inconsistent thing. What we're looking for is genuine people with with great authenticity. Um, you know, the skills that Jamie talked about in terms of holding a room, the sort of entry level stuff. But uh, you really look for someone that that has the authenticity and a, and a desire to work in the industry in a in a meaningful way, way and not the sort of short term. You know, I want to make a name for myself, but actually, I want to work on a long term project and and really put my energy into something and for me it was um, you know wanting A to work in gin but B to, to sort of express myself creatively um, through the medium of, of, of I suppose marketing in, in a, in a, with a small M um, and, and, and talk you know work in an industry that I love in a, in a way that would allow me to channel in lots of other interests and, and for me that's why, why Hendrix was the perfect brand for me to, to work with. Great. Um, hopefully drinking is one of them. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. The um, thing about an ambassador is they absolutely have to have credibility as well when they step into a forum. You know, they, it's not it's not good enough any longer to uh, you know for for uh, you can't you can't train passion and you can't train credibility. So those are the key things that you need to start with when you're when you're recruiting a brand ambassador. Yeah. The other things can be trained, but you can't train that enthusiasm and that credibility. That those individuals have within markets. <laughs> Look at Diego Cabrera with uh, Tanqueray and the, and the good work he's doing with Tanqueray in Spain. That's built in, in many respects on on, um, on on his strength as an individual and how well known and how well respected he is in market. <clears throat> Dan, one of the things that you touched on, and I'm going to come back to you on it, is is the the whole digital uh, piece because I think increasingly, you know, uh, brand ambassadors are leading their own digital Facebook experience or Instagramming work or they have a trade role, they have a consumer role, they're uh, trying to be their own sort of pocket battleships in marketing terms. Can you talk to me a bit about, about that and how you see that developing? Yeah, I, I think the digital channel is, is an interesting challenge because clearly as brands you want to talk a lot about stuff. Um, it's just that punters don't necessarily want to listen to you a lot. Um, we really just spoke about stuff when we had something to say um, and there's really two strands of, of what we do which is uh, we come up with cocktail ideas either on our own or in conjunction with friendly and interesting bartenders uh, and we tell the story of our business um, and we try and tell it as honestly as we can and I think the reason people are interested is because they sort of feel a part of that because they've helped fund us and they want to, they want to hear that story um, we try and tell it as honestly as we can. We told most of it honestly. When we lost the whole batch for 24 hours, we didn't tell them about that. Um, Charles? But, no, not to do with Charles. <laughs> 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 the, the joy of large careers. Um, but, but I think it is difficult once you, I mean, it, it's relatively easy for us. We're very small, we're, we're just starting. Uh, we can involve people in the, com the, the commercial things that we're trying to do are interesting, generally to people. When you get bigger, you know, the fact that maybe, I don't know, three shifts didn't turn up at the bottling plant is perhaps less interesting. Um, mm. And I think part of the challenge is how do you find something that is, I suppose, meaningful and interesting for your audience that is different from when brands first started to use social media, which was, you know, boo, it's Monday, way, Wednesday, hump day, Friday, hooray, time for a drink, weekend, hurrah, you know, repeat as necessary. Um, and I think just how, to, how to, to find interesting stuff, but I guess most importantly, knowing when to shut up, which is what I'm gonna do now. Jamie, you've just launched a big trade program uh, across a number of channels. How important do you see the digital channel uh, for the trade in particular? Oh, I think it's, it's hugely important, hugely important. I mean, it's that sort of the whole Facebook, brands have been built on Facebook, social media, Twitter, etc. Um, and I think it is, it's hugely important. And also linking in with, you know, brand ambassadors specifically, uh, going back to what Sam said, I mean, they're, they're looked upon as oracles, some of them, to, to know what's happening within the trade. And they're also deemed, you know, a lot of, a lot of the top brand ambassadors deemed to being rock stars. So... Whatever they say, people are going to listen to them, follow what they say. Grateful Dead. Absolutely. Yeah, well, it's just <laughs> yes, but you, exactly. Um, those sort of things. So I think it's you know it's hugely important that people aspire to be a brand ambassador as well. So when a brand ambassador says something, people aspire to be that. They'll listen. 
those sort of elements. So actually building a brand and how they, they're a conduit for the story throughout social media is hugely important. Duncan, one of the um, paranoias in marketing departments is that if you let uh, people out in the field have their own opinion about stuff, all of a sudden they're speaking on behalf of the brand and is that going to be an issue and so on. How, how have you found that? Uh, yeah, it's, um, it's definitely a big issue in the, in the world of brand ambassadors in the sense of, you know, we used to have these little black book analogies, but now it's our Twitter accounts or our social media accounts and who owns it? Is it the brand? Is it who owns those relationships? You know, if a brand ambassador is out making them on a daily basis and they, they leave or they decide decide to, to do something else, you know, it's, it's a really tough thing. So um, I don't think any one company's got the answers at the moment. I see a lot of, of the big guys sort of trying different things with sort of various hashtags from teams of ambassadors being, being thrown around and, um, you know, inserting your brand name in between your first name and your last name to sort of make sure that it's uh, owned and, and, you know, various guidelines being issued. Um, I don't think there is one answer. I think it, it, everything requires balance. And obviously, from a marketeer's perspective, you want your ambassador to be carrying the right messages. But you also don't want a social media account that's meant to be a real human being sounding like a marketing triangle of hierarchy of messaging. So um, I think uh, for us, we actually find it really easy because it's, it's very individual and, and lots of the stuff that we're doing with the brands in our markets is an expression of our own interests and our own sort of pursuits and um, you know the, the stories that we've got through various projects you know are usually tied into other human beings and, and you can you know it's all very sort of transparent but um, I think as teams of ambassadors around the world grow you know how connected they are to the actual distillery the actual process is, is something that constantly needs looked at and, and I'll, I'll come out and, you know one of the things we're looking at right now is trying to make our brand ambassadors more connected to the process by giving them you know sabbaticals in their fourth year to um, do the GCD at the distillery and, and you know become real hands-on experts and sort of investing in them in the long term because it used to be the case where the ambassador was the distiller you know on, on, a, on a cleaning week or something they'd go into a world tour and, and visit key markets or, or you know they've got the same last name as what's written on the bottle which is um, you know an incredible sort of credible resource if we're now extending that ambassador family and there are hundreds of them now around the world you know in a club that used to be tens um, you know how how do you maintain that that sort of authenticity is, is a big challenge do you want to ask a question? One of the things I think, if I were, if we were a bigger brand, that perhaps I'd make more of, is is some of that difference of, of opinion. Because actually, the fact that you think the perfect recipe for a Negroni is this, and one of the others absolutely disagrees with you, for me that that's more that's more genuine and that's more interesting. Mm. And actually, that that might be something that that then connects more back to the the innovation bit. I think sometimes bigger brands try to do this whole. Oh, we've got to all say the same thing and do the same thing. And actually, that, aside from being not true, it's also less interesting. <clears throat> I, I agree that I don't think big brands should be afraid of having a lot more kind of personality online and maybe perhaps a number of different voices. Obviously, it, it is very important to try and manage that tone of voice um, in, in digital marketing and to make sure that's consistent. But I do think sometimes the bigger brands are a little bit overzealous in the straitjacket uh, they put their ambassadors in and actually relaxing a bit and allowing them to seem more human actually will be much more valuable um, for their brand. But don't, don't do it too soon because no. the, the artisan <laughs> brands really like the fact um, um, but Are there any rules like no tweeting after 10 o'clock at night? Uh, <laughs> no. and, um, Drink the test. So we come up with all our best stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, because I suppose there is a there is a legal aspect to this, which is as an employee of a uh, of a company, you need to be careful what you say, particularly if it's a negative, you know, impression of a of a bar or or, or some, yeah. some other element. I mean, there's a, again another uh, amount of emotional intelligence that comes into that and a bit of tech. But I think most big companies will have do's and don'ts regulations go through that sort of training of of what to do and what not to do. Okay. Um, I th we've covered quite a lot of bases here um, and I think it might be interesting to take some questions from the audience uh, if people 
from different sized uh, companies are, uh, are interested in, in, in a point of view from the panel. Um, so I'm not entirely sure how this works, but uh, uh, do we have questions uh, either of the panel as a whole or uh, of in for individuals? So the panel as a whole. Um, in the UK, 75% of gin is sold at retail. The conversation this morning has been mainly on trade. What does the panel feel uh, the um, opportunity is for brand ambassadors with the retail trade? Um, Sam, do you want to kick off on that? I, th I think it's more of a challenge, but um, the, the, the point from, from my point of view, um, in terms of, of how you market a brand, you start with a, sounds very boring, a little prosaic, a kind of commercialization strategy. And to be perfectly honest, if you're growing a brand from scratch, your first year is very much focused on the entree, the influencers, the right bars, the right cities, a metropolitan model. And if you get that right, your conversations with the consumers and then your conversations with the off-trade should flow from that, should be a natural evolution of that. So, uh, you know, my sense is you don't often start all guns blazing, in my experience, with the off-trade. Actually, the off-trade strategy is an evolution of your, uh, your on-trade strategy. Um, and if you get your tone of voice right there, and you get the right advocates within the, uh, the on-trade, and among particularly millennial consumers, through your conversations with the on-trade, actually, that off-trade strategy flows from that. Duncan, uh, on-trade to, to off-trade? Yeah, certainly it's a, a big um, transition. Hendrix was built in the on-trade, and now we're achieving the scale we've got through the off-trade predominantly. Um, and I think uh, my my role personally has been, you know, trying to get myself or you know people that, that we work with internally in front of as many consumers to, to tell that uh, the story and to to explain as much as we can. As often as we can, and and it you know when we were starting it was sampling and it was you know liquid on lips and you know isn't this different, whereas now it's it's more about the events and trying to create um, talkability I suppose is the word around the brand through through having sort of experiences. Um, I think the role of an ambassador in the off trade is is somewhat different, but it's a lot of the same. It's it's you know telling stories, it's creating um, advocacy and and letting people make a personal connection with the brand and uh, as marketeers or, or whatnot we often talk about you know on presentations as you know target consumers what we remember is that actually we're all these target consumers we're all real people and the people that are drinking our gins they're not just the target consumer they're a real person and they like all of us wouldn't see themselves sort of cookie cutted into a segmentation um, mm -hmm. and things like that so I think the brand ambassador's role is, is really to remind marketeers often that and, and that we're, we're not selling to a, a portion of the population, we're selling, we're talking to, to real human beings and, and the more real our experiences can be and, and sort of uh, varied and, and interesting in a sort of genuine human sense, the more powerful they will be. And don't forget as well that, you know, talking to the buyers at places like Waitrose and creating relationships with them in the same way as you have with the influencers and the on-trade is crucial. You know, the Waitrose guys are our mates. They're our friends. They're at the, you know, they are at the distillery. They're there. Uh, they sit there. They have drinks. They have conversations. They visit. And, you know, those relationships are, are just as key um, at that level as they are with the, the influencers. And much like you were saying about providing experiences, they want to provide in store <coughs> experiences. And if you can take best practice or examples or ideas or concepts which you've come up with in-house, you know, that, that you know, competitors may be paying agencies thousands of pounds to try and brainstorm, you know, what can we do in the off-trade channel? If you can take things from real live on-trade environment and give them, you know, first bite to a, an off-trade buyer, you know, you're, you're instantly got something that none of the other brands they're seeing that they have that they get really excited about because they see the potential of doing something different in-store. Jamie, are you going to be in Waitrose on Saturday sampling? Well, yes. Um. <laughs> Not necessarily Jim, but I'll be there. Yes. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah I, again, I think, you know, a brand ambassador, a lot of the time it's always seen as a, as a figurehead, especially a global brand ambassador. So if you can bring them to an event or a tasting or these sort of things, it normally brings an element of, of cachet and also some PR credibility. So if you've got a lighthouse account, for example, for, for an off-trade, 
account that you can host an event for. It's, it's looked upon as a, you know, a partnership event that will build that relationship. So it all comes down to building relationships, probably a little bit more subtly, a little bit more commercially driven when it comes to the off-trade, but just as important. Dan, you got a... Yeah. Well, our vast empire um, <laughs> is going live with our first retailer next month, which is a, a small boutique uh, independent. Um, I suppose what we've learned is what, what they like about it, for better or worse, is that as, as the owners of the company, we spend a lot of time with them. Uh, we'll help them develop um, uh, an event. We will give them stories to tell, hang out with them. Uh, and I think as a result of that, they feel that our brand is, is more valuable. Um, they won't discount it, which is pretty important to mm. us and obviously very important to you guys. Uh, and I think as much bigger versions of us, I think the biggest challenge is how do you persuade your retail partners not to devalue your brand? It broke my heart the other day. I went past a poster that Tesco's had put up and it was basically a shed load of Stella Artois cans and it basically said, cheapest here, only blah, blah, blah. And somewhere there's a brand owner crying into their beer, whilst the trading person is probably very happy that they're still listed in Tesco. Uh, but I think how you manage that and, and how you create those reasons, whether it's the relationships or whether it's something more tangible that they can feel special about your brand, then, then I think that's got to be the aim. You don't want to get to the stage where the stories that are being told about you in the off-trade are so far different from the stories that are told you about you in the on-trade. So in the off, yeah, yeah. it's all about value, it's all about pile of money, sell them cheap. Yeah, exactly. And in the on-trade, you're trying to have complicated, nuanced stories with uh, with influences in the industry. It doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, and that's where things really come unstuck. Mm -hmm. It's got to be joined up thinking there. Um, Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> another question? I, this is for the panel, but I guess especially for Dan. Um, if the U.S. is anything to go by, there's probably going to be a tsunami of craft, you know, distillers and gins and whatnot coming through. And bearing in mind that the big guys pretty much have brand ambassadorship down now, you know, it took them a while to sort of understand it and get going, but it's pretty slick at the moment. There's a lot of brand ambassadors running around. With all of these new craft guys coming online, um, how do you think the, the model has to change, or, or, or will it change? And I'm asking specifically because you guys have diametrically opposed attitudes to messaging, for example, which is interesting. So I'm just interested to know if you guys think that the model is going to be forced to change or, or will need to with those guys coming online. I can give you a point of view. I, I think slick is really boring. Um, I think everybody's seen it. I mean, I think if you want to get, and there's nothing wrong with getting into weather spoons, um, you know, it's going to do wonders for, for your volume. You know, a slick presentation to a board of people who are sitting there ticking boxes and crossing as to whether you're going to hit volume rebates, great. I don't think that's the way to build value in brands. I think the bartenders that we've spoken to, uh, again, probably only spoken to, I don't know, between about 50 and 70, something like that, they've all liked the fact that, I mean, I've personally been, we've been doing this for three years, there's a lot of stuff we don't know. They like the fact that we're honest and we say we don't know that and we'll go and find out. They like the fact that we're struggling a little bit. I mean, we're, we're only small, so you know, it's, it's a different thing, but they like the fact that <coughs> they talk to us and it's, in their view, us against the big guys. I think, uh, yeah, I, I really, I just think slick is dull. Uh, I think people are looking for more authenticity was a word, uh, more interesting people. Yeah. Um, Sam? I, I agree, and I think that the challenge is, as you grow, um, you're absolutely right, there are some very skillful ambassadors out there uh, you know, who understand their brand intrinsics inside out and know what their messaging should, should be and so on and so forth. But there's no substitute for getting uh, the real person out there in market. Uh, you know, we've, uh, Sam Goldsworth has just spent six months in the, in the, in the <coughs> States actually having real face-to-face -face conversations with consumers and with trade. And that works because it's absolutely real. Um, it's genuinely keeping it, uh, keeping it real. And the trick is, I think, as you grow, to never lose sight of the fact that however big you are, you've got to carry on understanding what it means to play small. Uh, and that's absolutely, uh, absolutely key. Jamie, this idea of you know, having your key people out there and sort of competing at on a distiller by distiller <coughs> level, you see that? Yeah, I mean, going, I guess going back to the initial question is, is being realistic about your ambition. 
um, what is it you want to be? So a lot of the craft guys mm -hmm. don't want to be, you know, the, the next big brand. They just want to make a living. I think micro segmentation without getting too know exactly where you can compete, where that sort of area is. Um, and then also, I think the people that you're alluding to, I think what you mentioned before is, and Hendrix did it brilliantly to start with, is the people you choose to work with, make them feel part of your success. So when you work with them, I mean, uh, Hendrix did it brilliantly, I think, starting Edinburgh and Bramble, all those sort of places, that the bartenders felt that they were part of something and they were, they were part of that success and driving it. Again, talking about bartenders, but I think that's... Can I, can I just working. press you all a bit on Louise's question? Because I think it is, w w I think what she's saying is, we, we've all developed a model. It looks like a brand ambassadorship. Lots of people come out of the bar trade and they all say things in the same way. And there's got a bunch of people coming over from the States with interesting brands who are going to challenge that. Now, Dan's been talking about small is beautiful and about doing it from the, the, ground, the, the ground up. How, how is the whole business of brand ambassadorship going to change to be different and, uh, and interesting with all of these new brands coming over because we're going to have a craft off soon aren't we you know we're going to have a who's got the most obscure botanicals and uh, I, what I, curly pot still have you got i um, think you'll get a group of a group of people together a group of distillers together you'll get more groups especially in the u.s there's no way that you're going to be able to crack it on your own unless you're you know very lucky so i think you'll get groups of people together that will, that will you know that will have some similarities that work together um, but the, again, the authenticity of actually having the person who creates it, um, who's actually there and still creating it, and, and can tell that story is going to be key as well. Dan, got to I think, as for me, like the, the <coughs> we call it a tsunami of, of crap, it's going to create a lot of, um, of, I suppose, noise. And for me, I think that noise is, is great and should be listened to as long as the, the stories are authentic and, and genuinely interesting. And, and, and a lot of people, you know, sort of would say to Henrik, you know, you must be really, really scared of all the craft, craft distillers that are, are coming over because they're, you know, stealing your, your customers. And, you know, we, I guess, being from a whiskey family, um, the whiskey industry is probably a pretty unique approach to the, the whiskey industry. It's been very collaborative. The message has always been there's room for everyone and actually having more people interested and more people understanding and taking an interest is actually going to benefit everyone. And I suppose that's that's very much the, the grant standpoint. And you know, I was chatting to um, uh, gents from Pickerings earlier and, and I'd met them last year at a festival and first time we met them and he said, you know, we're the competition. And I said, well, actually, the gin industry in particular is, is always been quite... Um, obviously competitive amongst the big brands, but the, the more conversations that we can have people drilling into the gin category and finding these points of differences, finding out what style of gin, the differences between the different styles, the difference that that might make in a cocktail or their favorite gin and tonic syrup is, is a good thing for everyone. So um, we're now being sort of called in some articles like a gateway gin, um, where people come into the gin industry through Hendrix and then they get onto the harder stuff, you know, further down the line. And I'm, I'm not, not sure I agree with that. So Hendrix is a trainer gin. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, was our, it was our best, best performing targeting uh, category on Facebook. What? Hend Likes Hendrix gin. All oh, right. <laughs> Remember where you heard it first. I'm not sure Duncan's going to be too happy about that. <laughs> um, sorry, just a couple more questions before we close, Seth. Um, from my experience, I, I work in a bar in Wiltshire and we have over 180, 190 gins. And I know there's some up north with over 400. Um, do you think with, going on that question as well, with all these gins coming over, do you think the market is getting so diluted, it's getting harder to actually push your brand into a market which has got thousands now? And so when is enough enough? Yeah. Um, Sam, you, you run I, I bars. I have, yeah. Uh, many. Um, it's. Um, I think you know. Yes, there's no question. It's increasingly different, difficult to to get cut through, um, and it's one thing to get visibility on your back bar or whatever that bar is with the 400, uh, 400 gins, and it's quite another to translate that visibility into uh, to rate of sale. That's a completely different challenge, which comes back to the role of the ambassador and the role of relationships and and all those sorts of things. I don't think that bars are going to be able to maintain the number of gins they've got on their back bars forever, because you can't have stock that doesn't shift um, at the end of the day, unless it's perhaps doing a marketing job 
for you as a bar or, or a restaurant. So I, will, I do see some shrinkage in the category. And spending time in Spain recently, it is absolutely evident that there is a process of rationalisation taking, taking place, even in Spain, um, in, among top gin bars, where they are shrinking the number of uh, gins they hold for practical, pragmatic reasons. Um, uh, you know. and, and so, yes, it, it is happening and it will happen, um, is the answer. And it is going to become increasingly difficult to get traction and get cut through. Yes. So um, I think that sort of concludes uh, this section of uh, the event. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you found it useful and informative. Thank you. Thank you.